This week at the National Press Club, DFAT Secretary Francis Adamson. Ms Adamson has served as the nation's top diplomat since 2016. Her term as secretary comes to an end this Friday. Here's Francis Adamson with this week's National Press Club address. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra. I'm the club's president, Laura Tingle, and we're going to hear the Westpac address today from one of our most distinguished public servants and diplomats, Francis Adamson. It's rather shocking and um, we should be slapping ourselves on the wrist because she's the first female head of a department to appear here at the Press Club in her own right. But to mark her exit from uh, one aspect of public life and into another one as Governor of South Australia, uh, there are a lot of people here to celebrate her career. Most notably, we have both the Foreign Minister and Shadow Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne and Penny Wong, uh, a huge collection of department heads from across the public service, and notably, a full table of 12 former and serving public service heads who happen to be women as well. So quite a, quite a milestone. And uh, I'd like you all to welcome uh, Frances Adamson. Darua Nuna, Darua Nunawo, Yangu Nalawiri Dunimanin, Nonawawari Dauruwari, Ningada Dindi Wangara Lijinin. Today we are all meeting together on this Nunawo country. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders. Thank you, Laura. Now, acknowledgements have already been done, and this puts a diplomat in a quandary because normally we would do them at length. Um, I won't today, but I do want to say that a DFAT's always been very loyal to its ministers, and DFAT's ministers have always been very loyal to us. So I'm delighted today that we have past portfolio minister, Simon Birmingham, present cabinet minister, minister for foreign affairs and minister for women, Maurice Payne, Zed Sizelja is here as well, past present and in our system of democracy, who knows, one day may be future. To speak at the National Press Club in, and I should have said, and future, I didn't get the response I needed to that. <laughs> Penny, uh, Penny Wong is here as the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. I'm told, actually, it's the first time we've had uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Shadow Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs in the Press Club. And I think that says something about you. To speak at the National Press Club in my final week as secretary has a personal significance. My late stepfather, Stuart Coburn, was a long-time South Australian journalist and Walkley Award winner. As Robert Menzies' press secretary in 1952, he controversially introduced recording and production of prime ministerial press conference transcripts. My husband, Rod, was a regular here while First Secretary Press and Public Affairs at the British High Commission in the late 1990s. My brother, Stuart, was once a writer in Japanese with the Sydney Bureau of Gigi Press. And Sophie, our youngest daughter, is editor-in-chief, if you can believe it, for Bergman College ANU's Daily, D-A-L-E-Y, News. And so to the working journalists, from a personal and a professional perspective, I have a high regard for what you do. I appreciate there's sometimes a sense of anticipation, perhaps born of hope rather than experience, that departing public servants might tip out a trove of hitherto protected <laughs> information and opinion. I hate to disappoint. That, that is not my style. I've always striven to uphold the values of an apolitical public service, serving the government of the day from Prime Minister Hawke to Prime Minister Morrison. That I'm leaving the APS does not for one second alter my commitment to the discretion required to maintain those principles. Nevertheless, after five years as Secretary and 36 in foreign policy, there's a broad canvas to paint on. I want to reflect on three issues, three constant threads that through my career have engaged and challenged and gripped me, given me good days 
and a few bad ones. Issues vital to the nation as well as to shaping my career. First, I will give you a practitioner's perspective on Australian agency in a complex world. As the Foreign Minister has said, we have agency and influence to contribute to shaping our region through the decisions we make and the actions we take. With astute dis diplomacy and inclusive rules grounded approach, Australia can shape our region to better suit our interests. I will then offer some views about China. We need to remember that we have agency here too, especially when we work with others. Finally, recognising that major foreign policy challenges demand our most creative, capable and talented people. I will talk about something I, as DFAT's first female secretary, know is fundamental to our national strength, embracing diversity and specifically the power of women in leadership as a driver of performance. Australia is by almost any measure a success story, prosperous beyond the imaginings of previous generations, safe, secure, free, democratic and diverse. A great place to be. Even as the world is ravaged by a pandemic, Australians feel fortunate and if not immune, then largely protected from the worst health, economic and social impacts of COVID. We have difficulties and imperfections too. But if we take any lesson from Australia's success through the pandemic, it should be that we, like other nations, have some capacity to shape the world around us, particularly in partnership with countries with which we share values and perspectives. We have agency, and we should use it wisely. I won't spend time describing the current situation. It's true that good policy is founded on analysis, but the business of effective foreign policy is action, implementation and influence to deliver results. The values, systems and standing of the developed world are being challenged. The West's advantage in economic, military and technological power is ebbing. Unilateral advantage and zero-sum diplomacy militate against the task of managing the challenges of both strategic competition and economic interdependence. The international order is being remade and there are big agendas ahead for Australia. How the world, and more specifically, our near region recovers from COVID-19. How we and others respond to China's growing power and ambitions. How we deal with climate change, including via the dramatic energy transition underway. How international rules, standards and institutions evolve, and on what basis. What matters in the face of this is Australia's ability to determine and exercise choice and to exert influence built on strong domestic foundations, a vibrant economy and a cohesive, open and confident society. You would expect a DFAT secretary to observe that diplomacy must be at the forefront, but how? It's not just about responding smartly to events or crises. It's also about defining feasible objectives and shaping outcomes. Diplomacy is and must remain our first response to a rapidly changing world. It is the primary route to the Prime Minister's objective of a regional balance that favours freedom. Building coalitions, negotiating agreements and winning candidacies supporting health systems in our region, understanding and then shaping the thinking and policies of other governments in line with our interests and to the broader benefit of the international community, delivering market access and establishing fair and transparent rules for international trade so that our companies can prosper, maximising the benefit of aligned interests with fellow democracies, as was so tangibly on display at the G7 Plus meeting, and working in clear-eyed collaboration with countries with a different worldview to our own, particularly in Asia. 
Even in a pandemic, diplomacy is about being there on the ground, learning, negotiating, listening, advocating, doing so in person and ultimately acting with clear purpose to advance Australia's interests. The expertise and resources needed for diplomacy are worthy of serious investment because our job is to prevent the fracturing and instability that leads to a vastly more expensive and more destructive tools of statecraft being required. As General Angus Campbell, and it's wonderful to have CDF here with us today, said to me once, if DFAT is effective, he can keep his expensive tools in the shed. A view shared by General Jim Mattis, while US Secretary of Defence, in relation to diplomacy more broadly. It's why President Biden pledged to, and I quote, elevate diplomacy as the United States' principal tool of foreign policy, end quote, and acknowledge that it requires discipline, a coherent policy-making process, and a team of experienced and empowered professionals. In a world where everything that matters, good or bad, is so closely interconnected, the department that I've led integrates strategic, trade, development and operational tools to advance Australia's interests. My colleagues are capable, some of the best negotiators in the world, and many who are steeped in the politics, language and culture of our region. The amalgamation of our foreign and trade departments in 1987 and the integration with AusAid in 2013 created a Department of State with 113 posts in 85 countries, with around half of our staff based overseas, including our highly skilled and valued locally engaged colleagues who give us an edge in understanding the subtle dynamics of the countries where we work. We are the sharp eyes, the attuned ears, and the influential voice of Australia overseas. There have been countless examples in my career where we have chosen principled action over passive fatalism. Consider, for example, APEC, the East Asia Summit, G20, the Quad, or Ramsey. Australia has successfully advocated for leader-level engagement lifting the significance of these bodies which shape prosperity, stability and security in our region. Our investment in the leadership of international organisations, for example, the OECD and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organisation, enable us to contribute directly to the setting of rules, standards and norms. Much of the agenda we pursue today was articulated in the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, something former Minister for Foreign Affairs Julie Bishop charged me with overseeing when I was appointed. In fact, I recall the cameras were invited in to capture the moment I received my instructions. There was no pressure there. Our approach to the Indo-Pacific focused on strategic balance and a regional order based on rules remains the lodestar for Australia's policy. Our alliance with the United States remains fundamental to the levels of security and stability we seek. We have deepened cooperation with Japan, Indonesia, India, and other critical Indo-Pacific partners. A Pacific step up draws together our national interests with a focus on the three pillars of economic, people to people, and security all coordinated through the whole of government office of the Pacific. And it's great to see my Deputy Secretary colleagues and Ewan MacDonald, head of the office of the Pacific, with us today. Whether it's pandemic response, vaccines delivery, health security and recovery, infrastructure financing, economic integration, labour mobility, security cooperation, or supporting Pacific women to lead as the Minister for Women and Minister for Foreign Affairs has so strongly done. Our agenda reaffirms our long-standing relationships with our Pacific Island family, all in direct support of our neighbours' sovereignty, resilience and shared priorities. Yet by necessity, since 2017, the government's policies have evolved in ways and degrees of ambition not envisaged 
when we drafted the white paper. Some of this was recognised in the 2020 Defence Strategic Update. The risks we face have grown. COVID-19 and a shift in attitudes to free trade and globalisation across the world have profound implications for an open economy like ours. The ability of our neighbours to navigate, in the Prime Minister's words, a poorer, more dangerous and disorderly world will define the kind of region we live in. Pivoting our development program to assist our region to limit the damage of COVID-19, be it through delivering vaccines or providing economic support, has been vital. To no small degree, influence in our region will be shaped by who contributes to regional recovery and on what basis. Beyond the government's increased support for regional COVID-19 recovery, we need to consider carefully whether our development program and international lending match the needs in our region and the tough competition for influence now underway. Some of these issues will be for my colleagues and my successor to grapple with as they advise government, but they matter to all Australians and to our national discussion. No challenge better demonstrates the need for active creative diplomacy than China. I'd like to speak a little about this country which represents the single most important variable in our external environment. I have witnessed China's growth and change from three different vantage points, from Hong Kong in the late 1980s, from our economic trade office in Taipei in the early 2000s, and as ambassador to Beijing from 2011 to 2015. This experience has helped me understand how history, culture, politics, and most importantly, internal dynamics and real and perceived vulnerabilities influence the choices that China makes and the way it sees the world. I became ambassador to China as the Hu Jintao period was coming to a close. China had been experiencing a remarkable transformation, shedding some of the rigidities of its past and becoming better integrated into the international mainstream after joining the World Trade Organization. Urbanization, the promise of further economic reforms, the beginnings of a legal system protecting civil rights, a middle class open to new ideas, new products and new experiences. I was there for the elevation of Xi Jinping from vice president to president in 2013 after becoming General Secretary of the Communist Party of China in late 2012 at the 18th Party Congress, through to my return to Australia in late 2015. Arguably, it is in that period and the time since then that we've seen the most consequential change. The clock has been wound back in terms of the priority accorded to ideology, quashing voices of civil society, and erecting new barriers to external connections and the free flow of information. China speaks of a new type of international relations as if it is a fairer way, an improvement. But underneath, it is the same old power politics, the raw assertion of national interests. The implication being that China's size and strength make its interests more special than those of others and that these must prevail. Few really grasp that this great power is still dogged by insecurity as much as driven by ambition, that it has a deeply defensive mindset, perceiving external threats even as it pushes its interests over those of others. It is too ready to suspect containment instead of judging issues on their individual merits. And I always find it useful to remind myself when faced with strident official representations, that the pressure exerted outwards on other countries must also be felt within, at an individual level, by those subject to that system. Insecurity and power can be a volatile combination, more so if inadvertently mishandled. We need to understand what we're dealing with. As you know, the number of Western journalists in China is shrinking. The insights of journalists covering China in the past, and there's a long tradition of that, including Australians right back to the Republican period, 
and today have enriched our understanding. That understanding helped forge closer bilateral ties that served the interests of both sides. This is, of course, one of the saddest ironies. Those media voices on the ground give us an appreciation of what China is about in all its dynamism and complexity. Less access, less dialogue means less understanding. This siege mentality, this unwillingness to countenance scrutiny and genuine discussion of differences serves nobody's interests. It means, among other things, that China is undergoing a steep loss of influence in Australia and many other countries. The latest Lowy poll out today confirms as much, revealing that Australians' trust in China has fallen to record lows. What we tell the Chinese government is that we are not interested in promoting containment or regime change. We want to understand and respond carefully for shared advantage, not to feed its insecurity or proceed down a spiral of miscalculation. Nor do we see the world through a simplistic lens of zero-sum competition. What we are interested in and will continue to strive for is a peaceful, secure region underpinned by a commitment to the rules that serve, have served all of us, China included, an order that will deliver more stability and welfare to its members as it has done to date. To adapt a phrase from the head of Australia's National Security College at ANU, Rory Metcalf, our Indo-Pacific agenda is about incorporating a more powerful China into a regional order where the rights of others are respected and counterbalancing that power when those rights are not. This will be a long-term national challenge, probably for decades to come. We have a robust policy framework governing our approaches to China, which rightly we constantly test. It is partly defensive, yes, because China's actions require it, but it is also proactive and open to a possible model of beneficial coexistence that guards against conflict and protects Australian sovereignty while recognising China will inevitably have a larger say in the way our world works. China might hope for a fundamental policy rethink by Australia, as indicated by the pressures to which we've been subjected. But such hopes would be in denial of the very real, prospect, very real impact of China's behaviour on Australia and, importantly, the broad bipartisanship of our most fundamental policy settings. So we approach China with confidence, realism and an open mind. National resilience and internal cohesion are important when dealing with China but that doesn't mean we should demand uniformity of viewpoint. Debate about our approach is a strength, not a weakness. Indeed, in an era when political and social freedoms are being rolled back in many parts of the world, a healthy open debate is one of the hallmarks of a liberal system. And the best policy always comes from contestability. This is as true of the China challenge as it is of economic or social policy. In any event, the scale of the complexity we face, whether in managing our relationship with China or in positioning Australia to prosper in a more unstable world, demands that we have our most dynamic, creative and talented people on the case. This means actively cultivating diverse and inclusive teams. That's why Tony Blinken, in his first major address as Secretary of State, described diversity in the National Security and Foreign Service workforce as a national security priority. Diversity is something I've thought a lot about and sought to lead on as DFAT's first female secretary. I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs, as it was then, in 1985, in the first year in which there were more women than men in the department's graduate intake. This was also the year the government appointed the first woman as head of a Commonwealth Department of State, Helen Williams AC, Secretary of the Department of Education and with us today. And it was one year after the passage of the landmark Sex Discrimination Act of 1984, 
which obliged DFAT to change its recruitment practices. Looking back, I joined the public service at an important moment of cultural change in Australia. The women who joined with me in 1985 and I understood others had come before us, making compromises and sacrifices to forge their way through the male-dominated world of government. But we were also a generation of young women who didn't find the idea of female leadership in the public service to be unusual or revolutionary. It was something we expected and could realistically aspire to. Over the 36 years of my public service career, we've seen, slowly but steadily, more women rise through the ranks of DFAT and the APS workforce, including me. When I was appointed Secretary of DFAT, I honestly didn't think too much about being the department's first female secretary. I was well qualified for the job and ready to get down to business. But I quickly, from day one actually, came to appreciate the significance of being the first. The first female in a long line of 39 solemn black and white photos of my male predecessors, foreign and trade, on the fifth floor of DFAT's Barton offices. Because it's not just legislation and policies that affect cultural change, it's also about visible and engaged leadership, the concept of how can I be what I can't see. And on that very point, can I just say how wonderful it is to see my fellow female secretaries, past and present, and maybe there are a few emerging in the room as well, who have provided such visible leadership. One of my proudest moments has been to oversee transformation of our senior leadership, including our diplomatic missions overseas in terms of gender. In that latter endeavour, I have had the strong support of my ministers, first Julie Bishop and now Maurice Payne. In 2016, when I started as secretary, just over 31% of our senior executive service were women. Today, the figure is just over 44%. Today, 42 of our career heads of mission and heads of post, or 45%, are women. That's compared with only 23% in 2016. This trend has led in turn to other first women in my time as secretary, many first women actually, but including recently Penny Williams, Jan Adams and Kathy Raper, our first female ambassadors to Jakarta, Tokyo and Seoul. Julianne Guevara, the first Indigenous Australian woman to be appointed to both a head of mission role as our ambassador to Spain and a global ambassadorial role as ambassador for gender equality. I focused here on women in leadership. However, our strategy, leadership and programs of work to enable diversity and inclusion in DFAT go well beyond that. The first accountability of a leader is to create a safe and inclusive environment that allows people to come to work, perform at their best, and to have hope for the future. As DFAT's inaugural overarching diversity and inclusion champion, I've worked with support from many passionate, capable colleagues to drive organisational and cultural reforms that recognise diversity in leadership and in our workforce as central to our value proposition as an organisation. To be more representative of the Australia that we serve, we need to continue to lift our ability to recruit, develop and retain the rich diversity of our people and talent. Progress here begins and ends with leadership at all levels of our society and organisations. I'm proud to say that the department that I am leaving is now the one I hoped I was joining in 1985. Looking ahead, and a couple of things to conclude on. The present crisis has provided extraordinary proof, I believe, of DFAT's value within government. DFAT's contribution through this stressful period, including, and I really must emphasise this as I do in every conversation I have about it, the success of our people at posts operating under unprecedented pressures through lockdowns and vaccine rollouts, often without the support of family or loved ones. That contribution has been clear to the government and to Australians. 
COVID has also reinforced the value of Australia's development program. We've been able to help our neighbours in such a front-footed way because of the relationships and resources that were in place before the crisis. Our network of global trade arrangements and free trade agreements built up over the last 25 years is cementing the contribution of trade to our economic recovery. And our support for regional recovery will pay for itself if we can start the business of reconnecting, getting economies back on track and preventing resurgent poverty from eroding stability. Our best option to weather the pressures we face as a nation is to demonstrate that we cannot be divided, that we stand firm together. We should continue to work with others to shape the region, the world we want to live in. Because an outward looking Australia, fully engaged with the world, is essential to our future security and prosperity. Thank you. That's another first for the press club, Francis. Um, for a public servant, perhaps. <laughs> um, yes, it's not a room stacked with a lot of political hangers-on. Um, uh, you've made a few really interesting points today, but if, if I take you back to 1985 and, um, and the world we were sort of entering, um, respectively, it was a time when Australia was starting to look to Asia. Asia still looked at us, at us as, as the place that somebody famously described as people who fly over us um, or, or come for, for holidays. I just wondered, uh, based on your comments, uh, if you could reflect on the changing nature of diplomacy in the region uh, as a result of China, as in does uh, the, the uh, a sort of new approach of China, has that changed the way the rest of Asia looks at Australia? And have we left it too late in that competition for influence uh, in the period ahead? There are a number of questions. I thought you only had one question. <laughs> President, Look, President, sir. Uh, 1985, I mean, Australian governments over decades have invested in Asia, and certainly all of the prime ministers that I've worked for in that period, uh, indirectly or directly, starting with the Bob Hawke period and, and through to the Scott Morrison period, have been very seized of the importance of Asia and very seized of the significance of the relationships that they personally de develop with their counterparts. And of course, what we do is provide you know, the, the platforms to build those relationships, the depth of engagement. We don't do it alone. We do it in partnership across governments, you know, with, with the private sector, the people-to-people -people elements of that engagement, the long history of educational exchange speak to that as well too. Look, I do think though the, the conversations in the region are evolving, have changed in fact, when it comes to China. And of course everybody understands the economic powerhouse that China is and to some extent people want a bit of that action. It generates export growth, investment, uh, jobs, prosperity. But I think across the region, uh, every single country, and I can't think of one that doesn't have, every single country's got its own red lines, if you like. And part of the conversation at the moment is how can we build the resilience of the region to help defend those red lines. And in that endeavour, I think Australia is seen as a very capable partner. We see that in relation to the development of the work we do with ASEAN, the centrality of ASEAN, if we call it, the agreement now to annual summits with Australia, and a whole range of very practical outcomes. So from my perspective, it's not too late. It was never too late, and it's certainly not now. We are in there having very detailed, respectful conversations, and there's a, a growing sense within the region and beyond it of a need for solidarity at this very challenging time. Um, and uh, despite what Francis Adamson said, I think that was just one question, which I'll ask everybody else to reserve. Uh, it's David Crow. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thanks, Ms. Adamson. David Crow from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Very interested in your speech and your remarks about China turning the clock back. I remember you were with the Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull at the time in Antalya in Turkey at the G20 in 2015, 
when he met Xi Jinping. I'm interested in your view about whether it was apparent at the time that Xi was going to turn the clock back in the way that you describe. Was that always the direction he was going to take? And the reason I ask that is because I'm interested in whether you see any signs within China of a change in that dynamic at some point to turn the clock forward. Mm. Look, I think, uh, as with most things, it's, it's rare for there to be a, a sort of a sudden and seismic shift. It can happen. You know, I, I recall uh, after the 18th Party Congress, it was actually some time. Uh, we know it traditionally has taken Chinese leaders a long time to consolidate their power. It seemed that Xi Jinping was consolidating his power more quickly than his predecessors. And the early signals in relation to press freedom and a range of other things in particular, were start, starting to be accumulating data points. There, were a range of, there was a range of other information coming out as well. But I think it is much, much clearer in 2021, and it's become successively clearer. In, in 2015, there was still quite a broad, deep engagement agenda, which, of course, we would very much like to be able to resume in areas where it's possible for us to... Uh, to collaborate uh, and to cooperate. In terms of winding the clock forward, I can't honestly say to you that I think that is in prospect. But what I can say, and I think uh, it, it is well known and understood, that authoritarian regimes are inherently brittle. And if and when change comes, it may well come quite quickly. Uh, but I would not want to create any sense at all that that is in near-term prospect. Anna Henderson. Uh, Anna Henderson from SBS World News. Uh, look, thank you for your address today. I wanted to ask you about the increasingly dangerous situation in Afghanistan. What do you see as the obligations Australia has towards the Afghans who've worked with Australia and how serious the threat they currently face is? Look, we've, Anna, we're very seized of that at the you are, um, minister, the prime minister, officials, and we are all doing everything we can, the relevant departments, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Department of Defence and the Department of Home Affairs, to ensure that our applications, the visa applications that you've spoken about, are processed as quickly as possible. We do recognise that the Afghans who, does, who have served us, uh, some of them are in actual danger, some are in potential danger, and we take that responsibility very seriously. Stephen Judgetts. Hi, Secretary. Um, look, I know that in some senses this is a question for the Defence Department, but obviously there's enormous anxiety at the moment. Yeah, if the CDF would like to stand up. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> um, there's obviously enormous anxiety about the Taiwan Strait at the moment and the prospects of conflict across the Strait. We've had warnings from very senior members of the US military that they believe that there is at least the prospect of an invasion, potentially within six years. What's your assessment of the current status when it comes to the Taiwan Strait? And what do you believe, realistically, the prospect of conflict is right now? OK, thanks, Stephen. I first visited Taiwan in 1987 uh, on one of the regular trips that I made from Hong Kong. Taiwan was part of my beat then. At that point, Taiwan was still under martial law and tanks were lining the runway. On that first visit, uh, the International Red Cross announced that it was uh, able to reunite the Kuomintang KMT, um, those who'd fought on the side of the KMT and retreated to Taiwan, that they were going to be able to visit the mainland on reunion visits. And I went down to the office uh, the Red Cross office there, and I saw these, they looked to me as a 24-year-old, very old and very wizened. They had tears in their eyes at the thought of being able to return to the mainland. That was then, and this is now. Then the thinking was that uh, mainland China would militarily have the capability to retake, if you like, Taiwan by force around the time of 2030. That was in 1987, 1988 seemed like a very, very long time away to me. I thought then, uh, because of course One Country, Two Systems was being, if you like, uh, put in place in Hong Kong under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, 
Uh, I thought then that the solution, if you like, to the cross straits issue ultimately would be a, a uniquely Chinese one. I, I still actually think that that's the case. I don't think it will be a one country, two systems formula. I'm not sure what it will be. You know, the, the uh, questions about the military balance and military capability are indeed best directed to defence. My job as a diplomat and Australia's role in the region, though, is to ensure that the stability and prosperity is maintained. And, and the Taiwan situation has a real contribution to make to that. So I look at where we are now. I look at what we need to do, what we need to say and what we need to do to keep that the case. I, I'm not going to entertain anything that gets into the range or into the realm of hypothetical. I think the government's formal statement of this was set out in the Defence Strategic Update last year. Jonathan Kersley. Thanks very much for your speech here today and for what you've done over the many years as, uh, as an ambassador, as a diplomat, as a bureaucrat. Um, can I ask you, seven months ago, the Chinese embassy handed nine years a list of 14 grievances. Can I ask you, what was your assessment of it then? And seven months on, what impact do you think it's had on the way Western democracies view and deal with China? Well, my assessment then, to be very blunt, and I've only got two days to go, so I will be, was that... <laughs> was that it was a massive own goal by China. I mean, we can't, no Australian government, no democratically government, elected government anywhere in the world could say that those things weren't important. I couldn't understand why they did it. And I don't know that they really understood themselves exactly what they were doing with that list. I think it's played very negatively for them uh, and most recently in Cornwall. Um, technological breakthrough. Um, we're going to have our, our life member, Sabra Lane, my, my predecessor as president, uh, beam in from Hobart with a question. Well, where do I look? <laughs> <laughs> Francis Adams, uh, congratulations on your long career in the Australian Public Service and good luck in your position as South Australian Governor. My question is also touching again on China. China cut relations with Norway after the Nobel Peace Prize awarded the 2010 prize to Liu Xiaobo, and it was another six years before relations were normalised with Norway. Given that, do you think that that's an indication of how long Australia might have to wait uh, for Beijing to normalise relations with Australia, given also that uh, Norway, you didn't have ministers banging the drums of war? <laughs> Thanks, Sabra. And look, I know I can see you on the screen there, but I'm not absolutely sure where you are, so I'm going to look, look in, that, in that direction. Look, at Norway, I mean, they didn't completely sever relations with Norway. What they did was they put the relationship with Norway in the freezer. And at the time, that was a, intended to be a, a salutary lesson to everybody else. And then shortly afterwards, uh, China took action against Japan on rare earths. Uh, and then over time, there have been a, a collection of actions, a series of actions taken uh, against countries which China has regarded as acting contrary to its interests. Uh, and we are now in a situation where uh, China is pursuing that sort of action, taking that sort of action across a very broad front, never as broadly as it is now. I think one of the things that we sometimes don't realise is this, Australia is not unique in this respect. Uh, you know, the, the language that China uses about the United States is even stronger than the language it uses about Australia. Uh, any country in the world at the moment, we've seen it in relation to vaccines, that takes action in its own interest in a way that China sees as cutting across it, its, is liable to some kind of response. Uh, in some ways, that's been called, uh, called economic coercion. Uh, in terms of how long it might take, I mean, really, this is up to China. Uh, I've set out today, the Australian government has to... I mean, we, we seek to engage China. Everything we say about China um, at, the, at the governmental level, prime minister, ministers, uh, public servants, in as much as we speak about this, is respectful. So uh, I think, though, that it may take some time. And I think it will only be when China sees its own interests as being served by a different model that it will change. But China is immensely pragmatic. 
and if and when it chooses to sit down with us and others and conduct a relationship that is constructive and mutually beneficial, as the Chinese would say, we will be ready and so will others. And of course, I personally hope that that day comes sooner than later, but we will maintain our principled approach and we will build our resilience if necessary for as long as it takes. Thanks. Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review. Uh, congratulations on your career, Ms. Addison, and best of luck in South Australia. Um, we've seen this week the uh, draft determination on, uh, on uh, the endanger listing for the Great Barrier Reef. There's been suggestions from within government that uh, the, the, the hand of China has been behind this through their influence in sort of um, UN committees and, and various other bodies. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and more broadly the issue about Chinese influence within the UN and these international standards setting bodies. What, what, how, how pervasive is it? Mm. Thanks, Andrew. Well, look, uh, I mean, I touched in my speech on the, the importance of a, of a rules-based system, if you like, the importance of rules and norms and of us investing, if you like, in the defence of those because they provide a framework that works for everybody, whether you're a big state or, or a small state. You know, there are a lot of things being said about this and in relation to the World Heritage Committee, I would simply say at the moment the issue that we are dealing with, the government's dealing with, the issue that's relevant to Australia is a technical issue. We will deal with it uh, in, 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 as a technical issue and work it through the system uh, to, the best, to the best way that we can. Due process around these things is really important. That underscores the broader value of the system that we're talking about and investing in. So, look, I, I read what's said, I hear what's said. From a, from a diplomatic perspective, we're working through it as a technical issue. Thank you. In Packham. Uh, Secretary Ben Packham from The Australian. Um, you said in your speech, uh, diplomacy must be the first response uh, to a rapidly changing world. I wonder then if you could reflect, please, on um, uh, how it is resourced compared with the last resort um, in a, a rapidly changing world, um, that of defence. Um, defence has some $270 billion, uh, for new capabilities over the next decade, um, and yet um, DFAT is trailing you know, far behind that, and um, foreign aid remains uh, stuck at $4 billion a year, I believe, um, and um, sort of going backwards in real terms. Um, uh, so just wondering if you could um, talk about that and um, uh, is that something, uh, is that a regret that you have, that, that you haven't been able to sort of shift the balance there? And I noticed you mentioned in your speech that that's something uh, to look at uh, for the future, um, whether you could expand on that a little bit. Thanks very much, Ben. There's a big invitation there. Uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not going to accept it, you know. I'm going to say... Um, how pleased I am, and I seriously am, because I've made DFAT's budget a very, very high priority for my time as secretary. And I leave the department, uh, you know, it's got nothing to do with, with well, my advocacy possibly, but we've been able to, the government has readily accepted the argument uh, about the structural issue that needed to be fixed in DFAT's budget. We've been funded, I mean, to the tune of over $2 billion in the last the budget we've just had, the one before that, not so long ago, and the MyEFO in between. A significant part of that has been development assistance, you know, temporary targeted above the $4 billion envelope. I mean, there's a marker there, should the government want to do more? Uh, should it assess that the needs of the region oblige it to do more? Should it feel that it's got the capacity to do that? Of course, there's an opportunity there. And there is an opportunity, you know, for... for um, uh, diplomacy to be better resourced. But the argument that somehow, you know, DFAT with this budget and defence with that are whack, way out of whack, government absolutely needs to be investing in long-term defence capability. It is investing in our current uh, diplomacy, getting more people, funding to do a whole range of things. I have no doubt that my successor will pick up that argument and run with it. Tom Connell. Tom Connell from Sky News. The election of Joe Biden has transformed that country's pledges on climate and seemingly turbocharged at least the pledges of a lot of other key countries. Do you see any risk that our climate policy could ostracise Australia, perhaps mean we get less help from key allies on things such as China? Uh, well, 
how, how shall I answer that question? I mean, uh, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be a, bit, a little bit careful about what I say, but, but look, the government's position is very clear at all levels, right? I'm not going to go into that or the, the nuances, the ins and outs of it. Our job as diplomats is to ensure that what Australia is actually achieving is understood. Now, lots of debates over numbers, over levels of achievement, levels of ambition, these sorts of things. Our job is to make sure that our democratically elected government's position is understood uh, widely across the globe. And at the same time, though, we have, we've been deepening uh, relationships with partners on a wider range of issues of mutual in interest. So I detect no read across at all between the issues that, you're, that you've raised. Anthony Galloway. Uh, Anthony Galloway from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Thank you for the speech. I was wondering if you can say whether you regret any actions Australia has taken over the last, say, 18 months with the China relationship. Um, particularly, do you regret not getting other countries on board with the coronavirus inquiry before that was announced? Well, the short answer is no. <laughs> what? Can I just follow you? You can have another one because I was so brief. Why, why, didn't we, um, why didn't we marshal international support for that inquiry before it was announced by the minister? I think it was so totally obvious that an inquiry was needed. I mean, it, these were the discussions across the, the globe at the time. I mean, we can't... It always puzzles me, actually, that people keep coming back to this because the need was so obvious. And we then immediately swung into action... With, through our diplomacy and work with a wide range of like-minded partners to produce ultimately what is a good result. It will take time to sort of work through the system. Everyone seems to be fascinated with this. It's really not fascinating. <laughs> okay. Sarah Ison. Sarah Ison from the West Australian. Thank you for your speech. I um, wanted to ask, after this really long, successful career, you talked about um, diversity and how important that is. Uh, have you faced any challenges as a result of your gender in your whole career? And in Parliament, there are currently concerns this week at the return of Barnaby Joyce, particularly among women. Do you worry that his return will dishearten women in the public service, particularly this year when we've already seen some other events that people have guessed will similarly dishearten women from joining the public service? The, the deeper issue that you raise is, of course, a really important one. In relation, though, to my own experience, I've had a pretty good run, <laughs> I have to say. I've always worked with respectful colleagues. I've been given opportunity after opportunity. I've been helped and assisted with flexibility in relation to our four children. I should have acknowledged, by the way, and he's looking at me in a very kind way, my husband Rod's um, contribution to all of this because I wouldn't have been able to do it without him. But, but of course, the broader issues are important. And we need, we're going to need to continue, I think, a, a conversation around you know, the, the, the deeper elements of uh, women in the workplace, uh, gender equality more broadly and what it means in all respects. But I'm not going to get into sort of individual instances. I think everyone who works in the public service, male and female, knows it's a pretty good place to work. Abilities are recognised. We've still got... It's not perfect. We've still got some work to do, but uh, I would strongly recommend it to anyone who's looking for a can you future career. Can you understand some of the apprehension, though, particularly this year? Well, I, I'm, not going to get, I'm not going to go to the specifics of your question because I don't actually think it's appropriate for me to do so, but I've spoken about the broader principles uh, in my speech as well. Simon Gross. Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. Uh, let's fly down to Antarctica. In, uh, when you've finished being uh, the Governor of SA, you might be able to catch a flight down to a concrete um, airstrip that Australia is planning to build. Um, I figure the idea is that Australia creates a gateway, to Ant an aviation gateway to Antarctica, and we can become the gatekeeper. Am I right in that? And to what extent is there a risk that we create a precedent that other countries then think, well, it's cool to build concrete runways in Antarctica? Well, I think whatever the substance is, it's been acknowledged for a range of reasons that it's important to have an all-weather runway in Antarctica. There are a range of reasons for that, including 
you know, in relation to the safety of the people who, who work there. Uh, I, I can see where you're going, but I think it's not the right place to be going. Australia's got the uh, ability to do this. The government's decided that we should. There are a wide range of reasons to do it, for doing them. I, in, in our consideration of the issue, in a variety of different forms, the uh, scenario that you sketch out has not been one of them. Doug Dingwall. Doug Dingwall from, Doug Dingwall from the Canberra Times. Uh, Francis Adamson, thank you for your address. <laughs> um, in recent years, there's been debate about the reliability and the dependability of the US as an ally to Australia, although there remains very strong support for the US alliance. Mm. Uh, how long do you see the US remaining engaged in our region to the extent it has been over the last few decades? And not only engaged, but engaged in a way that maximises its influence. How long? Well, I mean, the US engagement in our region has been absolutely fundamental to the peace and stability security that we've enjoyed since the end of the Second World War. And of course, we're going to be celebrating later this year the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty. I think we've seen through successive US administrations, and, and particularly the Biden one, each one of them looking at the region uh, in light of their broader global responsibilities. I think there's no doubt at the moment that the Indo-Pacific region is seen as an area of primary strategic influence. The US is engaged strategically, economically. I think you've seen that in a variety of ways. I would expect us to see more examples of that. Uh, and from Australia's perspective, that would be something that we would continue to welcome and support. Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Um, just another climate question, and uh, this time on carbon border adjustment mm -hmm. mechanisms or border tariffs. Yep. Uh, what is your assessment about how inevitable it is that there will be at least some countries or regions that take up carbon border adjustment mm -hmm. mechanisms and the risk that Australia faces from that? Well, look, I think obviously it's something that's being talked about. Um, you know, when something sort of breaks through as an acronym, a, a CBAM, you know that it's uh, not just an idea that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. I do think, and my trade negotiator colleagues, and I do think we've got some of the world's best, uh, tell me that it's not at all clear how this might work in technical terms in a way that is WTO consistent. I think at the moment it is being used, uh, if I might say so, as a, as a sort of forcing mechanism, a potential forcing mechanism. How it might work in practice, I think, is yet to be seen. But Australia would certainly be engaged, including through our mission to the WTO, into discussions about you know, uh, what, what this might mean and, and whether, in fact, it, it would be consistent with the World Trade Organisation rules. We've got a, a big stake in ensuring that that organisation you know, uh, recovers its sense of purpose, particularly when we talk about a COVID economic recovery. Have you provided advice to the Australian government on reducing the risk that it faces it by increasing its level of climate ambition? Uh, I'll ask, uh, that's a direct question. I'll answer it with a direct question, no. Direct answer, sorry. Nick Stewart. You blamed Xi Jinping for the essence of the deterioration of our relationship with China. To what extent, though it can't all be him though, to what extent do you also look at Australia and think that, well, it's actually the department that has failed to represent our aims and objectives to China? Or do you think it's the politicians who are telling the Australians a, a bad story about what is occurring in China? Where, where would you describe, uh, ascribe the blame? Well, I don't subscribe to either of those possibilities. So what, where, where else is it? Is it all Xi Jinping? I talked about China's approaches during this period. In any system, of course, every system has a leader. Uh, I was not ascribing it particularly to any one person. I chose my words very carefully. I talked about the period, but I think, I think you know, it is, of course, but I'm not suggesting it's any one person. I do think, though, I mean, we have been very consistent and I see, of course, every day the cables reporting conversations, the very live interactions between our embassies here in their embassy and our, my department in Canberra and uh, my, our embassy and their uh, ministries in Beijing. We are communicating very clearly an Australian position. China has not chosen to be persuaded by that yet. I think it's an open question uh, whether that will be the case in future. 
And if and when it is, it won't simply be because of what Australia says. There will be a range of others adopting, I'm very confident of this, Nick, positions that are very similar to ours. Virginia Hausiger. Thank you, Francis. Virginia Hausiger, um, columnist for the Mandarin. Um, before you arrived as the first female secretary of DFAT, uh, in 2015, it was found that uh, there were only 25% of heads of mission were female. As you're leaving next year, it's quite possible that that will have changed from 25% to 50%. That, of course, will depend on the, uh, the Minister Maurice Payne. But uh, uh, that is an enormous jump. Your very um, uh, muscular movement to improve the status of women in leadership um, has been acknowledged by many. Just in a nutshell, um, this is a bit of a Dorothy Dixer, in a nutshell, <laughs> can you explain why Australia is served better when leadership positions are held 50-50 by men and women? Well, thanks, Virginia. And, and look, I wouldn't necessarily go straight to 50-50. Uh, you know, 40-40-20, as you know, is, uh, you know, 40% women, 40% men, and 20% that could be sort of either. Uh, I just think we've got to draw on the full, uh, the, the, the full capability of our population, our workforce, and, and my department. And I think we need in overseas service and heads of mission have a very particular role to play. It's not just a posting for them, it's, it's a formal ex-co appointment. A very particular role to play in uh, pursuing Australia's in interests. There's a significant advocacy role. And I think we've seen that a wide range of personalities and backgrounds and experiences uh, enables us to do that much more effectively. There's no sort of one you know, you can't say a diplomat looks like that. A diplomat looks like all of us. And it's about being effective. It's about taking the case. Um, and I've seen men and women, women and men across the board, some fantastic examples of that. So it's about creating opportunity and I'm just delighted. There was no target around this. Uh, people have just risen to the occasion. People have put their names forward. They've competed for positions. They've won them on merit and they're doing a great job for Australia. Mark Kenny. Mark Kenny, Francis, uh, from the Press Club board and also from ANU. Uh, can I take you back? You, you mentioned before uh, about the, the Wuhan inquiry into the origins of the virus mm. and how people are fascinated by it. I have mm. to confess I'm still fascinated by it, so that's my uh, warning about this. You make an ex excellent point, though, about China being uh, acting out of insecurity and the combination between insecurity and power mm. and how difficult that is. I wonder if you would agree that one of the tasks of a diplomat is to understand how the other party feels and is likely to interpret things. And if in that context there was any other likely interpretation by China to um, Australia's front running on that uh, question about the, the inquiry in Wuhan, and also, I guess, to some other things like the elevation to leader status of the Quad, because it plays so directly into that Chinese narrative about, you know, the US and other partners being engaged in a containment strategy. Look, I think uh, this is not about Australia particularly, the response on the inquiry. I don't think it's about Australia at all. I think China would have reacted. I mean, let, let's not forget, though, ultimately, when it came down to it, uh, in the World Health Organization. China voted in favor of that resolution. But I think whichever country had spoken first to get rolling an idea which was absolutely of its time and needed to be undertaken, there would have been a reaction to it. Now, how much of what we're experiencing actually is sort of related to that, I, I, it's hard to know. It really is hard to know. You're right that the role of a diplomat is two-way. You don't just transmit. You listen. I said we were the, you know, the eyes and the ears and the voice. Uh, and you need uh, your own government to understand what's going on. So that point, of course, is there too. But the corollary of what you've been saying is not, you know, just because something's going to upset China, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't act in our own interests. I mean, it just it bothers me a bit too that people seem to almost have a, have a sort of cringe about it. We need to be explaining things, and we do though. The way we speak to China in private and in public is absolutely consistent. And we, uh, almost to a fault, observe the diplomatic niceties 
of briefing them, of talking about what we're doing and why and when we're likely to do it. So that part of it is alive and well. Our last question is from Tim Shaw. Thanks, Laura. Secretary Tim Shaw, Director of the National Press Club. Thank you for recognising the importance of journalism and certainly media voices on the ground. And there are Australian journalists right around the 113 posts and yeah. uh, missions um, that sometimes don't always get the kind of accuracy they need for the stories about Australians living and working overseas. And as Senator Wong pointed out in estimates the other day, <laughs> Mr Jetchitz doesn't make this stuff up. <laughs> secretary, a note to the next secretary, whoever she or she may be. <laughs> that relationship between the Australian journalists, uh, Philip Williams, after 36 remarkable years reporting for us as a chief foreign correspondent, just that note to the next secretary about that relationship between journalists, the department, and instead of your team writing media notes, speaking directly to those relationships formed with journalists. <laughs> Noted, Tim. No Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. And that seems a great note on which to please thank Francis Adamson for speaking to us.